So I recently completed Pool of Radiance, the first of SSI's Dungeons and Dragons uh, gold box games, and a game that I played a lot of as a kid back in the day, but had never really beaten until now. Now, kind of because of this, and having played a whole bunch of the side quests and stuff back in the day, I did Critical Path it a little more this time. And also as part of this, I didn't actually capture that much gameplay footage of it, a thing I plan to rectify for future playthroughs of the um, other games in the series. Now, having come to the game now, with more experience having played both computer and tabletop RPGs, I think I have a better understanding coming out of this of how this game does and doesn't work as an adaptation of a tabletop role-playing game to the computer. Now, the game is a really great concept for an RPG adventure. It puts a player in charge of a party of adventurers, as with most D&D games, that travel to the city of Flan. Yes, it's a dopey name, but such as it is. Um, on the sea of the on the uh, edge of the Moon Sea, in kind of the central area of uh, Faerun, or the continent of Faerun. The city had been ruined and overrun by monsters in years past, and this is the first effort in a very long time to push the forces that have overrun the city out, and as part of this, the city government has put in a call for adventurers, a call that your characters have answered. Consequently, the objective of the game is to clear the various blocks of the city of monsters, along with completing a variety of quests for the city council, in order to make the city more livable. From scouting certain areas of the city, to forming deals with some of the nomads around the city, to even investigating a former sorcerer's tower that is spewing crap into the river so Sojanao, which runs past it. It's a really great concept for a D&D campaign. But due to technical limitations, it's not quite as executed as well here as it could be now. And we've seen examples of how well it could be done now, based on things like the PC adaptation of the Kingmaker Adventure Path from Pathfinder, uh, along with the first Pillars of Eternity game. And I can say this with a degree of certainty, because it was also adapted into a print adventure, or advanced Dungeons and Dragons. The place where the game falls down is how it executes the rules of the game, particularly when it comes to resource management. First off, when it comes to inventory limitations and encumbrance, is the big stumbling block here. Now, from a programming standpoint, there are very, very good reasons to institute an inventory cap and to even implement encumbrance in your game. You let people hold too much stuff, it causes memory problems. However, one of the issues with AD&D First Edition is that, as written, money was included in encumbrance, to the point where, if you look at the player's handbook for AD&D First Edition, the weight for things is not given in pounds or ounces or grams, but coins. That said, nobody I ever played with used those encumbrance rules because the lever of level of granular bookkeeping that would entail was tedious and frustrating. Pool of Radiance, on the other hand, gives money weight, something that Ultima and Wizardry didn't do, and neither would the Bard's Tale later on. Now, there's not that's an issue if there's a way to mitigate that. Like, the first couple Elder Scrolls games gave money and uh, weight, and had it included in your encumbrance, but it also gave you banks to deposit your money in, gave you ways to stash your gear places, that sort of thing. And also... Similarly, if this game had done a similar thing, given you a bank to put your money in. Also, this is something that uh, Dragon Quest did to help you address issues with um, losing money when you die, and that sort of thing. If you had a place to stash your stuff, to put the items you didn't need right now but might want later, uh, to deposit your cash, to put valuable magic items that you don't necessarily have a use for right now with what you're cur how you're currently loading out your characters, but want to hang on to for a future encounter, it'd be nice to have a way to do that, a base of operations. Indeed, this is something that the Elder Scrolls games would kind of go to make a major feature of the series, with Oblivion and Skyrim incorporating housing. Um, Skyrim even having a major expansion based around uh, not just having a house, but building a house and developing it. Here, however, there isn't anything like that. Which is also frustrating considering the premise of the campaign. It makes sense to give the players some sort of base of operation to further invest in the area, to financially 
and emotionally invest them in the success of the city. You are building and developing the city, helping it recover, and helping the city, city council rebuild. And you have put time and effort into making helping it succeed. We consequently, in a tabletop setting, you would want to get the players more involved and get them more interested and engrossed in making the city succeed. And in this case, part of this would be giving them a place of operations. Have a reason for the players to tie down roots. This even leads in more to later levels of first edition Dungeons and Dragons, where your party members become, for lack of a better term, landed nobles, where you get a chunk of land which your player can set up shop on and build a castle and that sort of thing. By being involved in the reconstruction of plan, you have a hook in a tabletop standpoint to drop that in. No such framework really comes up with the game. Which actually this leads to the other issue with the game. Because of the encumbrance problems, you often find yourself with a lot of money that you don't have any use for. And nothing to spend it on. One of the things where these, that money would be put towards, and part of the thing we're having the whole landed, invested, knight, noble, wizard's tower, whole nonsense with first edition, is it gives you a bunch, like, something to put all that money towards. All the hundreds of thousands of gold, the gems, the jewels, the, that sort of thing. You have something to do with it. Not just spending it on training expenses or on the tavern you because that money like unless you're sitting up with, with a boomtown level economy you're going to not gonna be spending like oh like a handful of gold like at most 20 maybe a hundred when you could be coming away from a successful adventure with thousands of gold indeed with Thunder dragon's first edition gold and treasures experience and in some cases finding treasure is a better source of experience and leveling up than just killing monsters with ruins of advent with, with pool of radiance the the pc version as opposed to ruins of adventure the tabletop module there is aren't any real money sinks the cost of training is a flat fee that does not increase with level. Something that even uh, Might and Magic did. Um, nobody is selling magic items. So, outside of ammunition for characters with bows, there aren't a lot of things to spend money on in town. You can't buy magic items or additional spells. That's the other thing that is a big financial cost sink for a party. Also, you can't research spells outside of combat. You can't go to the wizard's um, training hall and say, hey, I want my character to learn, to research, basically. Um, my character doesn't have, doesn't have protection from evil, and I want to learn protection from evil. Now I could go find a wizard scroll in the course of going through the dungeon and hit it that way. I can get it from a wizard spell book, or you could theoretically research the spell, which costs money. There's actually even rules and guidelines for it in the DM's guide. Um, some of this in a PC game could be heavily simplified as, spend a bunch of money, here's a chance you could get it, but you might not. And that would, but the game doesn't do that. Well, that would be another way to drain some of the large, enormous amounts of cash from the party out of the party coffers. But it doesn't, you don't have that. This all leads to the final problem, where I mentioned getting the party emotionally invested in the success of Flan, or excuse the player emotionally invested in the success of Flan, Flan and taking the city back. The tabletop game, the adventure, has a whole bunch of NPCs who are people in the city, the prime member of the city council, who you can interact with each with their own backgrounds and their own agendas, their own goals, what they're setting out to accomplish beyond the reconstruction of the city. The video game, the PC version, has one. Tadorna, one of the members of the city council, 
Can you do a handful of missions of him before he bet for him before he betrays you to the Black Network in Central Keep, and then skips town to show up at the fortress of Tyranthor Tyranthraxis, the antagonist of the game, as a prisoner later on when you storm the when you literally storm the castle at the conclusion of the game. Now, there's dialogue in the game through various journal entries because this is a uh, 80s PC game where, for space and memory constraints, you're referencing uh, a journal, either as a physical copy if you're buying and playing an older version or a PDF if you're playing it off of GOG, which has additional dialogue and information on that. Another thing which makes the game less photogenic for gameplay capture for recording. But in any case... It places hooks that the other members of the council are up to something, that there may be a traitor in the council who's working for Tyranthraxis for the boss. But nothing comes of it. Uh, Kadorna sells you out and skips town, but he's working for himself. He's clearly not working for the boss. Like, from the circumstances leading up to that, it is clear he's playing his own game. He's not playing for the bad guys, for, for the bad guy team. So, nothing comes of any narrative, really, around the rest of City Council. There's Kadorna, and that that's it. And it's a bummer, because, by comparison, say, games like, as I mentioned earlier, um, Players of Eternity, but also later Dungeons & Dragons games set within the Forgotten Realms, like Baldur's Gate, have a more fleshed out and developed outside group of NPCs who you're encountering with, not just party members, but people in towns who you're meeting to progress the game's story and or engaging in side plots with. There's nothing like that here. Again, this is an 80s DOS game, but still, nah. As I mentioned earlier, though, a lot of this is mitigated by the print adventure adaptation of the game, which is also available for PDF from DriveThruRPG, and I will have a affiliate link for it in the show notes below. At your own table with your own players, you can more actively incorporate the NPCs into the, the game, and there's enough information in there to do that. You can develop them as you want, but it gives you a good starting place, and you can provide opportunities for the party to get more invested in the city of Palan, Palan again, economically and emotionally. That said, my one main criticism of the adventure is that some of the city hexes, for lack of a better term, in of the city itself, of Falan, like are more fleshed out than others. For example, in the game, the first major area of that you're going to be going through is the slums. It is directly adjoining the city, like when you get your opening tour which shows you where all the locations are in the city, the inn the uh, weapon shops, city hall, the temples, all that sort of thing. It ends at you with you facing the entrance to the slums. You don't want to go straight ahead right away because you haven't actually bought weapons yet, so you need to go to shops to do that. But you are basically pointed at the slums and said, go here. This is your test to determine if you are worthy of succeeding as an adventurer, if you can accomplish this this quest, if you can clear the slums, you are ready for the challenges to come. So to speak. In the adventure book, the slums are mapped, but it is a it's a blank map. It's a blank environment which you can populate as you wish. Which, to an experienced GM, that's not a problem. You can generally figure out, okay, here are some good places to put encounters, that sort of thing. Structure the adventure at the environment as you see fit. Plus, there's random encounter tables and that sort of thing, so you can use that as well. But other than that, you can kind of figure it out and go from there. If you're an inexperienced GM, not so much. And in particular, if you picked this up because you are relatively new to Dungeons & Dragons and you liked the game and you wanted to run your own version of it for your friends, um then you're basically going to have to go through and pick up the, like, grab the clue book from your box set or what have you to use that to fill out the environments in the game in, in here with encounters that you would seem fit, or at least 
to know what you're putting where. And that can certainly be frustrating and makes the tabletop version less standalone than I would prefer. So, still, I enjoyed the game. I'm glad I finally have a chance. I finally got around to beating it. If you're interested in picking, checking the game out, it is available at GOG as part of Collection 2 of the Forgotten Realms Archives. And that version contains all of the Forgotten Realms Gold Box games. A link will be in the show notes below. That one will not be an affiliate link. I will, however, have an affiliate link to Ruins of Adventure, where you can pick that up as well. If you want to adapt it to Dungeon Dragons 5th Edition, it's first, it's late era, 1st Edition D&D, early 2nd Edition, so it actually adapts over fairly well. There's nothing too out there monster-wise. You should be able to, to port it over more or less using just the main three core books. If I was to drop a complaint in there, or a note in there about adapting this to D&D 5th edition, um, edition, the state of Zental Keep in Forgotten Realms in D&D 5th edition is very different than as it is now. You might make some tweaks in terms of how the Zentarum are used in the game, but other than that, that's fine. And you could also probably like move this over to some place on the Sword Coast as well, and fit it into Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide and the stuff in there just as easily. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 